All right. All right. I'm thinking we might be live now. <laughs> All right. It looks like we're getting some people jumping on in. Okay. Let's start sharing this first screen. All right. Hi to everyone who keeps popping on in. All right, so I'm just gonna, I think as more people are kind of slowly coming on in, it's just two minutes past the starting time now. So um, I think I'm gonna just start with um, going right into our new product launch. I'm really excited for everyone who's here. And um, just kind of wanna do a quick thank you for everyone who's you know here and then for our speakers who um, have very kindly joined us today to um, go over our new Yeast LIFO product launch. And it's very exciting because as a team, um, Matt Lolleman and AB Vickers, we've been working really, really hard on this and it's a really exciting time for everyone. So let's get this slide up. Perfect. Okay. So um, just to kind of introduce myself, uh, my name is Brittany and I am a technical sales manager for Lolleman Brewing. Um, I've been working, um, at least having a hand in this Yeast Life O kind of product launch. And um, I'm just really excited for everyone to be joining us today and to see kind of what this product is capable of doing. So as you can see on this first slide, I say that it's our Yeast Life O product launch and it's a new treant. <laughs> so um, actually right before I get into this, um, we have our kind of guest speakers here and we are going to be doing a quick PowerPoint run through of the product. And then we're gonna have a round table discussion with our kind of panelist speakers who are joining us today. And then at the end, we're gonna open it up to any live Q&A. So if you guys have any questions during this presentation for me or for any of the guest speakers who are joining us, please just put it into the um, question box at the bottom and we will answer it at the end. So um, it'll be kind of more of an interactive live Q&A thing towards the end of it all. So thanks for doing that and check it out when you can. All right. so. To finally get into our new product, Yeast Life O is our brand new nutrient that we just launched this week. And after extensive research and development, we have formulated this nutrient and it is specifically made, it's very specifically formulated for these yeast nutritional needs for these um, low nutrient fermentations and these sugar-based fermentations. So this includes um, hard seltzers, ciders, meads, um, and even high gravity beer. So this is a 100% yeast autolysate nutrient, and it's a 100% organic nitrogen source. Um, and this is, makes it um, also very bioavailable. Um, it's basically an insurance for a well-balanced yeast nutrition um, for reliable and clean fermentations. And this product is now available across the globe in two kilo packages. Yeast Life O is a new addition to our already existing nutrient portfolio that we offer at Lollman Brewing and AB Vickers. And in this portfolio, you will now find Servomyces, which is a really unique kind of one-of-a-kind product. It's a zinc-enriched um, yeast. It's an active yeast, and it um, provides a lot of zinc into the system. Um, and then we also have our Yeast Life Extra which is a complex yeast nutrient that includes nitrogen, minerals, and vitamins. And of course, as mentioned, we also now have the very exciting Yeast Life O, which is our organic nitrogen 100% yeast autolysate blend. And um, basically, our Lawman Brewing team, we've been working really hard, not only formulating and producing this new product, but we've also been 
creating a lot of informational resources to all of our customers and to all brewers out there. So a few things that I wanted to list off is that we have uh, our white paper, which was made called Feeding Yeast for Brewing Success. And at the bottom of this um, crowdcast, you'll see a little bar um, that says download the white paper. So feel free to click that link and that's where you will download this very informative um, technical document that we worked really hard on to provide you guys so you guys can have all understanding of yeast, nutrition, and um, kind of just um, nutrient needs. And another example um, that we will also be having, I believe we'll be putting this into the chat on the side um, of the Crowdcast, is another link for our best practices for hard seltzer fermentation. Um, this is a document that we worked hard to create that includes all of our recommendations for or basically like a SOP standard of practice or best practice for hard seltzer production. And this includes using our new Yeast Life O nutrient. So um, maybe if you're just starting out um, and you are just trying to figure out where to start with hard seltzer production or maybe you're wanting you've tried a few methods or techniques and you want to try something else when using Yeast Life O you know, go to this document, download it. Um, it has a lot of information there. And um, outside of these two documents, there's actually a lot of other resources that people have worked really hard on all throughout the Lawman Brewing team. And you can find them at our website, which is lawmanbrewing.com. So please go there and you can find our downloadable um, document section and you can just go through all the best practices and find ones that are um, necessary for you. So. Um, that is it of my very quick kind of rundown for um, our new yeast launch. <laughs> so next we're going to move to introducing our speakers. Um, so and since we have our guests all on screen, we first have um, Avi, who is I guess I was going to say the bottom left corner, but I guess I don't know if that's what everyone sees. <laughs> um, so we have Avi here, who is from Lollum and Brewing, and he's from our R&D team. And Avi, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I started with Lollamon back in uh, July of 2019. So I've been here for a little, a little over a year and a half now, um, <clears throat> coming on two years this July. Uh, my background is pretty much focused on fermentation microbiology and bioinformatics of complex fermentation systems where I did my I did my graduate studies at Oregon State University and their food science program, which is consequently where I met met Brittany as well. Um, and yeah, so I've been working for on this project for the better part of six months now just uh, formulating and trying different iterations of this product specifically for uh, to cater to these new or this growing hard seltzer market. I don't I don't even want to call it a trend anymore because uh, at this point like we're, we're just seeing such an exponential rise in in just market value and market dominance that like I'm pretty sure that it's here to stay. Uh, but awesome. yeah, yeah it's just a quick quick little bio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, thank you for joining us, Avi. Um, I really appreciate it. And next we have Mike Morris, who is the head brewer of Crank Arm Brewing in North Carolina. So Mike, feel free to introduce yourself and a little bit of your history. Your history in the brewing industry. Hey, everybody. Uh, yep. As Brittany said, this is Michael Morris with Crank Arm Brewing Company. Um, I've been in the industry brewing for 22 years in June um, so I like the kid that I've been doing it since I was 14 so because I look so youthful um, but anyway uh, Crank Arm we founded Crank Arm in 2013 um, I'm one of the, the partners and the head brewer here um, we promote an active lifestyle and especially cycling. Uh, crank arm is part of the bicycle uh, that attaches to the pedal. So um, I'll get more into why we actually wanted to do a seltzer and the production of that a little bit later. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions later, just let me know. It's a little bit about me. Cheers. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. 
And finally, we have Alexander, who is the head brewer of Oshlag Brewing and Distillery in Montreal, Canada. So Alexander, feel free to take it away and tell a little bit about yourself. All right, my name is Alex, uh, head brewer at Oshlag Brewery. Uh, Oshlag has been around for five years. Um, we've got our sister brewery, which is uh, Glutenberg, which has been around for 10 years. They specialize in non-gluten uh, beers. Um, we just started making seltzer last year, and um, yep, we're in it for the ride. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> all right, so again, thank you guys for all joining today. I'm really excited, and I'll start off with uh, asking some of the first questions that I have prepared for you. Um, so I'm gonna start off pretty easy, especially with the main topic here, hard seltzers. And there is no doubt that this market segment is growing really rapidly, especially as Avi said. Um, I even kind of looked up some numbers and they said that the market was expected to be around 4.5 US billion at the beginning of 2020. And they expected it to grow and now probably surpass, especially after the giant um, pandemic kind of drinking boom. <laughs> um, and they want now they think it's going to surpass even 14.5 billion by 2027. So when did you guys decide to start producing this type of beverage and what were your initial thoughts on it? Um, Alex, do you want to jump first? Sure. Um, well, it wasn't difficult to see, uh, especially in the US, um, where the trend was going, or like Abby said, maybe it's not a trend anymore, it's just a market is going there. Uh, our marketing department um, was getting pretty hyped up about it, so they let us know they wanted us to start uh, doing seltzers. So, um, I mean, why not? <clears throat> Sorry. For a brewery that does a lot of New England IPAs and Imperial Stouts and all that, it was interesting to have a product that was completely different and be able to offer an alternative um, to our normal clients or maybe to go and have a certain appeal for clients that don't normally drink these types of beers. Yeah, that's excellent. Expanding the product portfolio is probably right. a nice way to keep getting more people coming in. Exactly. Um, yeah. All right, Mike, do you have uh, anything you'd like to add about? Anything you'd like to add about? Yeah. Um, you know, we, um, we do beers of all across the board. And it was probably about 2018 that we started talking about it um, with my partners about doing it. And um, about 2019, I tried my first batch of it. We decided to go for it. Um, for us, it was it was twofold. Obviously, we're talking about the trends and the market share. Uh, and if we could make a craft seltzer, we thought that at least for our tap rooms, it would be really good. Um, maybe not initially competing with the the big boys in in package, but um, if we could have it offered for our tap room. And we thought, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're an active lifestyle brewery. We want people to be able to go on a run or you know, go on a, a bike ride and be able to come back and, and drink something that may not, you know, fill them up and may be a little lighter and easier to drink. And we heard we heard from our, our public and they said that was something they'd be interested in. So we decided to go for it. Excellent. Um, and Avi, do you have anything to add? I know you're in the lab, but um, anything about your kind of initial thoughts on the seltzer market as soon as it was kind of booming? Um, I think that it's it's what we're seeing, at least from the context that I, context that I have um, with my interactions with different breweries and different industry members, is that it's definitely starting to become more of a health conscious kind of thing. Like, um, you know, it's it's like what Michael was saying. Uh, it, for people with a more active lifestyle that still want to kind of engage in, you know, having a drink now and then, um, hard seltzers are, it's, it's a really great way to kind of still get that buzz, but without, uh, you know, the filling nature that of beer. And as someone who's not really a fan of light beers, it's definitely a great alternative, you know, in terms of just caloric contents or, um, uh, 
how filling it is, uh, how bubbly it is. Uh, so for me, I, I don't know, it's, it was kind of exciting just seeing um, this interest just kind of like skyrocket. Like it felt like almost overnight because when I, when I first started working at Alamon, hard seltzers were kind of a niche thing. I mean, even when I was living in Oregon, like back in 2017, 2018, uh, there weren't really a whole lot of offerings. Uh, it was kind of like a niche product, but now it just seems like everybody's doing it. And and it's great uh, because I, I know it really helps expand your brand portfolios. It opens up new revenue streams. Uh, uh, you know, it gives you greater diversity of ingredients that you can use. Um, but at the same time, it also maintains that simplicity. So. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> All right. So the next question, um, we'll probably just go in that same order again with the Alex, Mike, Avi roundtable. Um, so the next question is, you know, have you guys kind of attempted any kind of fermentation, sugar based fermentations like this before, whether it was hard seltzer or not, just something more of a sugar kind of starting substrate? Um, and did you feel like there was quite a bit of a learning curve or maybe do you feel like there's still a learning curve um, compared to your kind of typical brewing fermentations that you're probably used to doing? Um, I feel there definitely is a learning curve, um, especially uh, in regards to um, the fermentation and whatever comes afterwards. Um, in our case, we do a lot of filtration on our seltzer and that's been a lot of work actually to get it clear crisp uh, and, and bright. Um, fermentation wise, um, we had we do um, pretty high gravity brewing here sometimes. So that wasn't unusual. But what was unusual is how uh, barren um, the, uh, the fermentation was regarding nutrients. So basically, you got this like we, we brew our cells are pretty high up. So we're at 23, maybe 25 Plato. Um, and so there's not much nutrients from just all that sugar. Um, so that was uh, an adaptation that we had to do definitely. But um, yeah, so we, we've adapted with time. Uh, later on, I'll talk about the yeast that we were using before and the one we're using now, uh, with which we have good results. Excellent. <laughs> and Mike, um, how about you? Did you feel like there is also a big learning curve um, kind of like what Alex said. Yeah, I, it, it was it was probably one of the hardest things that I've undertaken in the in my career. Um, you know, like he said, not having those nutrients that you just naturally get in brewing, you kind of kind of take that for granted as a brewer. Um, everything that the the malt is providing you. Um, so yeah, I mean, the the first couple of trials that we did um, were horrible. I mean, I'll be honest. Um, like it, it it was something that we just had to dump. Um, so learning, yeah, learn, learning uh, how to deal with this has, has been a challenge, and it's definitely been uh, been something else. And um, yeah, th this was my first attempt at I would say I guess a a non malt based um, um, product, so. Excellent. Um, yeah, you know, I think I kind of like what you said regarding the, um, how you felt like you took it for granted a little bit of the starting substrate of, you know, malt and all the wonderful nutrients it gets. And um, I always like to say that um, sometimes, uh, you know, you know, brewers, you know, they're a little spoiled. They cut the wort kind of offers what the yeast wants, you know, and now it's kind of like this learning curve, figuring out what you have to add back in. <laughs> so I can understand that there's quite a bit of a learning curve there. Um, you know, Avi, I think it might be good to just jump to the next question since that one, um, the next question is for you directly. Um, and this one is kind of going to be a bit in depth, I'm sure. But since you kind of had a hand in developing the yeast lipo nutrient, um, can you maybe describe this, um, the yeast lipo nutrient for us? Um, what is it formulated to do? And what have you kind of accomplished in a lab setting? So I know that's kind of a lot going on, but um, I think you're going to be able to take away from here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so 
one of the things that we really had to look at was um, it's it, it comes down to the nutritional content of your substrate. So brewing a hard seltzer is quite a bit different than brewing a beer, um, as as Alex and Mike has have figured out that uh, the first steps that we did was okay, what's a similar fermentation that we can at least start to mimic in the lab. So we started looking at biofuel uh, because it's it's very similar substrate. A lot of biofuel is produced either from uh, degraded cellulose from say corn or from sugarcane. Uh, so you're doing a pretty much either a sucrose or a glucose fermentation. Um, now they don't really have to worry about how it tastes because it's going into fuel, but they do have to be very concerned about specific metabolites that are produced during fermentations because stressed yeast will uh, be inefficient at fermenting. Um, some because you want to have the most efficient carbon transfer from the sugar base into ethanol or some other form of combustible material. Um, and if some of those, if some of that carbon is being shunted into, say, like um, acetaldehyde or acetic or, or la acetic acid, lactic acid, depending on contamination types, uh, you'll have a very stressed fermentation and a low yield. So looking at that, that's kind of like how we built this process was looking at how best to construct these fermentations. So first we looked at sucrose and sucrose is great. Um, it's relatively cheap widely available and uh, it seems that it has a better connotation to it than than dextrose or, or corn dextrose specifically uh, but the problem is uh, fructose so with sucrose while you can get a very good fermentation with that uh, you can get some leftover sucrose which could affect the residual sweetness uh, and may not completely ferment and with glucose though you get a much cleaner much drier fermentation much more complete fermentation uh, so after looking at sucrose, we moved on to corn dextrose and found we had much better results. And then from there, we kind of started tweaking uh, the nutrient additions. And we were using specifically yeast autolysate because this is something that can be 100, considered 100% 100 organic should a brewery want to really pursue an organic label. Um, and that it's also just a complete fermentation or a complete nutritional blend for the yeast because it, it comes from yeast. Uh, and it really comes down to just kind of balancing that amino acid profile with the other stuff that comes with the yeast. So a yeast autolysate and a yeast extract, um, a lot of people use that term interchangeably because they more or less denote the same thing. But with, when dealing with the yeast autolysate, you get a lot of extra things too. So you can get like the cell wall, uh, the cell bits of the cell membrane, the extracellular proteins. Um, and these are very important for flavor and mouthfeel because what we really wanted to do when we set out to make this nutrient is that we wanted it, we knew that customers would be fermenting a product with plenty of downstream processing, like uh, natural flavors, artificial flavors, other treatments, like, like you know, just, just something to, to make it stand out. But we wanted the, the yeast that we plan on using and the nutrient to just make a good standalone product. Um, so like if you didn't want to treat it, it would still taste good, which has the benefit of just producing a very clean product uh, that can take up just about any flavor you want. Um, you know, could take on any flavor you want, but if you just want to provide a flavorless hard seltzer for mixing with cocktails or, or something else, like you got it. Um, and so we needed to take into consideration like the other components of the yeast. So in winemaking, um, yeast lees are important because you have uh, this thick extracellular matrix that actually provide mouthfeel to the wine. Uh, and it could also help improve flavor stability. So this was where much of our work came into because thankfully, like, yeah, uh, wort has been very extensively studied for the last 150 years. So we have a pretty good idea of like what the nutritional um, uh, needs of yeast are that can come from the, the wort. 
and we can kind of mimic that. But then at the same time, we just got to start balancing everything else. Uh, so that was really the hard part. Um, so I think like coming to that balance of you get that nice fermentation, nice efficient fermentation speed, but you also get a neutral or pleasant flavor development as well. Um, that was probably the hardest part of of really honing this in. Um, and so we pretty much exclusive or not exclusively, but extensively did work with specifically glucose because in all of our trials, like as we started really honing this in, like we were getting almost complete dryness. Uh, we weren't able to detect any residual glucose, which is great. And the yeast that we were using was producing a very nice balance of glycerol and ethanol um, because the glycerol also kind of much or too little uh, and that way you get like just mostly ethanol with maybe just a hint of fusel alcohols uh, that will just you know occur through normal yeast metabolism um, but yeah I mean I, I no that's I excellent on, but. <laughs> <laughs> well you did spend I think almost uh, six months working on it so I think um you know, you're allowed to have a handful of minutes to talk about it. Oh, no. Looks like we maybe lost Avi, but um, we'll keep going since the next question right now is for Alex and Mike. And hopefully Avi can reconnect and join us for the future questions to come on in. Um, but yeah, so now let's move back to Alex. You know, would you be maybe interested in sharing a little bit about your seltzer production process and um, you know, feel free to describe in however much detail you feel comfortable with. But um, yeah, the current process that you're using right now for the viewers who are listening, um, maybe sure. they can learn something from it. All right. Um, so basically, when we brew um, our seltzer, we're, we're using the kind of um, uh, high gravity brewing technique where we'll basically be brewing uh, a very strong ABV seltzer. So we're aiming for about you get to about 14, 15% ABV. Um, and after which we'll, we will do a dilution to bring it back down to 4.5, which is our target. Um, when we brew, we brew about 40 hectoliters uh, at a time. Um, we use a mix. We do Because of the law here in Quebec, we do have to make a small mash. So we make a Pilsner mash just to say that it's there. It doesn't contribute that much to the, to the final product, but it's, it's there. Um, we use cane sugar as well and dextrose. Um, we do a very short boiling time, which is 10 minutes, just to pasteurize everything. Um, before we do the cast out, we send it to the fermenter at about, depending on the um, on the yeast, we'll send it out at uh, between 23 and 25 degrees. Um, and we ferment about in that range as well. Um, fermentation times vary. Um, I know that uh, later on I'll be talking a little bit about um, our experience we've had here at Oschlag with the turbo yeast uh, compared with the CBC1 yeast from L'Alma. Um, both have worked, but not in the same way. Um, and so, yeah, usually we have about a, maybe a, um, I'd say it varies. The turbo yeast is very fast. It could be a three to four day fermentation time. Um, CBC1 is a little slower, but tastes much better. Um, we've been very pleased with the results we've had with that yeast. Um, we do a lot of work on the um, on the base once it's done fermenting. Uh, a lot of filtration goes into our seltzer. Um, that was part of the learning curve, actually, from a, a previous question. Um, so yeah, we, we we will filter it with the um, a lenticular filter, and um, and then we'll also filter it with an active carbon filter as well just to get it clean, uh, clear, and uh, we'll only be adding um, a bit of citric acid for uh, pH adjust adjustments. And uh, then we use uh, flavors, uh, which are natural extract flavors, which we added in the, um, in the bright tank at the very end of the process, just before canning. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Took me a second to unmute there. Avi, welcome back. <laughs> Lost you for a bit. Um, but yeah, Alex, thank you so much for sharing all that information. 
Um, I think it's really helpful for people to maybe hear. I think a lot of what I've learned, at least from where I've been sitting within the brewing industry on the yeast side of things, um, a lot of there is no kind of standard of practice yet or like a common way that everyone is doing this type of fermentation. I think each people and each facility um, have their kind of own methods. So I think it's interesting for um, hopefully also for the people who are here watching um, to kind of hear the different ways that people are going about it. So thank you. Um, yeah, so now Mike, um, yeah. Do you yeah, do you wanna share a little bit? Yeah, um, so we've been, I don't know, all over the board I would say. Um, you know, the I think I said the first time um, we produced something that I had to dump and I will give a plug to Yeasto Life because before Yeasto Life we were using diammonium phosphate um, as a source um, and I just I got so many off flavors um, some of it could have been user error brewer error if you want to call it that but um, it just did not seem to make a good product for me um, and so you know we're shooting for about four and a half percent alcohol um, the first time that we used Yeast Life in a trial, we also used, and this is, I think, skipping ahead a little bit, Brittany, but uh, we used the Philly Sour from Lalamon, and um, it was difficult, even with the Yeast Life, it was a difficult fermentation, I think, with the drop in pH that comes with the Philly Sour and the Sour Vissier from Lalamon. Um, even with the um, even with the potassium um, uh, the uh, the KCO3 buffer. Buffer. yeah buffer that we added <laughs> it was really hard for the yeast um, to work and really start fermenting um, we had about a a 10 to 12 day fermentation with a lot of rousing um, yeah it's um, I did the conversion it's a seven barrel for my UK and American brewers or about eight and a half hectoliters uh, batch so smaller smaller size like I said that's our that's our trial size here that's what we do um, if we want to try something out and we did get it down to um, about three to four play-doh finally I would have liked it a little bit drier um, that's the feedback that I got on that that first batch that that we produce for the public. Um, the one that I have trialing right now in the tanks, we used, forgive me, Y Yeast's uh, 1272. Uh, that's our, our house strain. And so we wanted to see if we would get um, the same results, if it would be easier with the 1272 with not quite the drop in pH um, because um, the reason why we did the Philly Sour and the Sour Vissier trials was we wanted to make a unique um, sour seltzer. Um, and then talking with some other brewers and my partners, you know, brewing a seltzer naturally drops the pH a little bit lower than even your, your beers would. So we thought maybe using the 1272 would give it enough of a drop and using you know, lemon or whatever um, adjuncts that we wanted to use later, whatever fruit products would make a make it sour, taste sour enough to call it that. Um, so, you know, right now I'm still on day number five of the fermentation and still adding a little bit of buffer. Um, that's another thing that I changed this one. Um, I used all of the buffer on day one and this time I'm doing it daily, just a little bit daily to, to get the pH up a little bit. Um, and it seems to be chugging along uh, slow and steady, I guess. Um, but we're, we're getting there. I just, I'm not getting that really fast fermentation that you're going to get from, you know, a, a beer. And um, so that's, yeah, that, that's my... Um, experience right now and like I said we're we're still young in the in the in the game so still learning all right 
right, thank you for that. Um, I kind of like how both of you guys have two different methods, especially, um, you know, you guys are looking for two separate um, kind of end products, one starting with a high gravity and one looking for a much uh, lower kind of alcohol content as well, um, even with like the sour edition of the, um, from the Philly Sour and Sour Vizier you're looking for. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Alex, you know, I know that you kind of mentioned it a little bit before, and if you want to go into more detail, um, maybe with your experience using the Yeast Life O nutrient and, um, you know, how that kind of compared to other solutions. I know that you used um, a turbo yeast before, and maybe if you want to kind of talk about the difference of that versus using the CBC1 and the Yeast Life O mm -hmm. nutrient and how that benefited. Sure. Um, when we started the seltzer project, since this was a, was a pretty high gravity uh, brew that we were doing, uh, we were looking for a combo, a yeast nutrient combo um, that would be a, a, a yeast that would have a high tolerance um, for alcohol and all the nutrients that we need to, to drive that fermentation through all the way to the end to finish dry. Um, the, um, it was the um, marketing team's hope that we would be at about 100 calories per um, small can. Unfortunately, we were just a bit above that. I think the last readings were about 110. Um, but um, so we, we chose a, a, an easy solution, which was a, um, I guess I can, I can name them because it's still a good product, but um, we've changed from that time. But it's, it was the Pathfinder yeast, which is a turbo yeast. And there's uh, the Pathfinder TY48, which is basically a, a mix of nutrients, uh, which has DAP and other types of nutrients as well, all mixed up into one. Um, so our first attempt with this uh, worked out pretty well. Um, I was surprised, however, at how uh, monstrous the fermentation was. In about three days, uh, it had completely fermented through. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't um, all that good tasting. It actually smelled and tasted pretty bad. So um, we had a lot of work to do downstream to clean out the product, um, especially with active carbon, and just to try to get it as neutral as possible before we added the flavorings. Um, so um, second time around, when we've used the same yeast, um, same method, we tried to control the temperature a little bit because we were uh, fermenting at high temperatures. Um, sorry, I don't know in Fahrenheit, but it's at 28 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, and so uh, we tried to control the fermentation a little bit and that kind of worked, but we then got a stuck fermentation where uh, I guess we tried to maybe bring it down a little too much and the fermentation didn't go all the way through. So um, that was a little bit problematic. I spoke with uh, Eric Abbott uh, from L'Allemagne. He was very kind uh, giving us some information and also sending us some CBC wine yeast. We were able to restart the fermentation and, uh, and, and see it to the end. Um, when we used um, the Pathfinder yeast, what, what I noticed was um, how charged, uh, how loaded it was in the fermentation. It was a very milky, looking product, it was very, um, uh, there was schemes that had lots of solids in suspension. Um, and it, it gave us a hard time uh, when it came time to, to go through fil filters. Uh, it took a long time. Um, when we moved to the CBC1 yeast and um, the, um, the new nutrient that we're talking about today, the yeast life O, uh, what I've noticed is that it was um, a lot less heavier, a lot less charged. Um, the CBC1 yeast flocculates very well. So that kind of helped us a lot when it came time to go through um, our filtration runs. Uh, I think we, uh, filtration run with the turbo yeast used to take about four hours or more um, to filter 40 or 45 hectoliters. And now it takes at least half that time or, or, or less than half that time, which is, which is very good on our side. Um, Flavor-wise also the, um, uh, the flavors, and as Avi mentioned it earlier, um, when I taste the base, once it's uh, filtered, uh, it tastes very well on its own. Um, of course, we add flavoring and all that afterwards, but it, it does stand uh, on its own, and that's very good to very good to know. We don't we don't have to work so hard to just remove all the off flavors and and get it down to a neutral base. Um, so yeah, so we, we've made the choice now. We we, we have switched to um, to the CBC one and the Yeast Life O um, nutrient, and it, it works very well. 
So uh, I think we'll be maintaining that path um, in the months and years to come. Thank you, Alex, for that um, wonderful explanation between the two products. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that you like the CBC one and the use life up. <laughs> and, um, you know, Mike, you know, you kind of touched upon this with the use of the Philly Sour and BRY, well, that you used Philly Sour and then you kind of finish it off with the BRY 97 strain to produce your hard seltzer. And, you know, I, I kind of wanted to bring this up because as Alex mentioned, he used CBC one and this is kind of what we um, really recommend, at least from like our SOPs and our um, hard seltzer best practice, the downloadable kind of content um, that I mentioned earlier. We recommend CBC one, but you use Philly Sour and BRY97, which I think is really um, you kind of unique. And I like that that was a different route that you decided to take. Um, you know, what kind of made you choose these strains and how do you think this kind of impacted the final sensory profile? Um, of your beverage. You, I know you kind of mentioned it a bit, but if there's anything else you'd like to add, feel free to jump in on that now. Free to jump in on that now. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the biggest thing for us um, was to make a unique product and uh, something that would stand out to this burgeoning, um, you know, seltzer world. Um, so, you know, we, we decided let's give it a shot right off the, the bat. Let's We've had so much success with um, with these yeasts, with with our beer, and they've been so successful um, for us in the tap room and on the market that you know we said let's let's apply that to the the seltzer that we're going to try. Um, and as I've said, um, we're we're just now in the trialing phase with doing it without those, but. It looks like the the pH is definitely going to be lower for those than what it will end up being where I am now in fermentation. Um, so I think that was that was the key um, for us was to make it a little more tart. Um, you know, it did finish at about 3.4 uh, on the pH scale. So. Um, that, that's that's pretty tart and then you know when we added the lemon um, it's it's a lemonade seltzer is what we made um, it definitely has a, a good tart characteristic to it um, one of the reasons I think just for ease of use and production in the brewery was, was the reason for going to more of our house strain um, instead of having to get um, new product every time we wanted to do the seltzer um, so that, that's just a little bit of the reasoning why we used it initially and um, kind of why we've switched. Um, not to say that, that we won't go back to trying it also. We'll see how this one turns out. So. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it all turns out good. Better having everything turn out good and not having to dump anything at all. So um, anyways. Um, the next question is, you know, this is just kind of summarizing, you know, thank you guys again for, you know, kind of sharing all of this great information and being really candid in your answers. And um, especially when it comes to your guys's processing and the troubleshooting that you've guys encountered over um, kind of this period of time and this learning process. So, you know, now that you guys have, you know, kind of mentioned a few things, but is there anything that you guys would want to maybe point out or highlight specifically as um, advice in regards to using um, maybe yeast lifo specifically or just producing seltzers? I mean, comes from, you know, adding buffer or maybe what sardine substrate you recommend or um, any or filtration, whatever, anything you guys felt like stand, stood out over your trials. Is there any advice that you would like to give to the people who are here today? Um, well, you can have yep. Alex go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, regarding uh, yeast lifo, uh, I think one of the parts that was um, uh, easy to use was that we could uh, we, we put it directly in the boil. It's a very short boil, and that was a, a very easy to do. And then we don't have to play around with additions in the fermenter and all that, other than the yeast when it comes time for uh, for the pitch. Um, so I did enjoy that. Um, I did notice um, that when we did add it to the boil, it um, clumped up very slightly. I think about 95% of it dissolved correctly and just a little bit created a small caramel-like substance. 
Um, um, but I could think that was just by the way we were adding it. Um, we were thinking about maybe making a slurry uh, of sorts to type of, to kind of uh, ease the blending into the boil. Um, but otherwise, I know I think it can be added directly to the uh, fermenter. Um, but we're very satisfied just um, pasteurizing it along with the rest of the brew and then just sending out to the fermenter as is. Um, otherwise, I mean, regarding seltzers in general, um, what I've realized in the past months is uh, since we wanted our seltzer to be more of a, um, I guess, a commercial seltzer or uh, along the lines of a white claw and, uh, uh, and, and all those, uh, we want it to be clear and um, really not have any remaining color. Um, so basically, it's a lot of work uh, on the filtration side. So one needs to uh, be prepared for a lot of filtration if you want to have a clear seltzer. Um, just maybe a bit of warning there for anyone interested in doing that. Or you can go my route and not filter it at all. Indeed. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, uh, I, 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 I say that, but we do biofine um, before we add the, the fruit or whatever we're going to use. So that, that's our filtration process. So we do try to get it clear. I, I joke, but um, the lemon definitely uh, does not allow for <laughs> super clear uh, looking product. But our consumers are okay with that. You know, I. I would just, I mean, my biggest advice would be don't be afraid to fail on your first attempt or two. Um, you know, it, it's it's definitely a process. Um, and do do your research, do your homework, um, even, even if you do, you know, sometimes it doesn't turn out great. Um, but I think we're on the right path. You know, I definitely think the Yeasto life and adding a little bit of the buffer um, each to me makes a difference um, I'm seeing that and um, you know maybe just make sure you give it a little more time um, when you're when you're fermenting so yeah, that's about all I've got awesome I also want to point out to anyone watching, you can also reach out to your regional or territory um, technical sales manager from Lallman Brewing because we have a lot of resources and we've been doing a lot of internal research and um, your local representative is going to be someone who would be there to help you. And you can find that on our website of lallmanbrewing.com. So just another note. Um, Avi, do you have anything else? Of, you know, you've done a lot of trials um, in the lab. I mean, is there any other kind of advice that you would maybe have as well um, from your experience of using the nutrient or just in hard seltzers in general? Oh, no. Avi, are you frozen? <laughs> All right. I think we lost Avi. <laughs> That's okay. We'll just go to the next question. And uh, if Avi comes back on, um, <laughs> we'll re bring him back for that one. Come back for that one. At least he doesn't have his mouth wide open or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, he looks pretty. He looks pretty good. <laughs> um, all right. So, just last question then from my questions before we open it up to any live Q and A. Again, anyone who's watching, if there's any questions that got brought up. Um, during, you know, this kind of roundtable discussion, um, please, you know, feel free to go to ask a question, add it into that box, and we will read it out loud and then ask everyone. So feel free to do that. Um, but yeah, last question for you too, um, at least from me, um, you know, just kind of in your guys' opinion, um, where do you kind of see this specific market going? And how do you think this is going to be kind of influencing the brewing industry? Alex, you can um, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, um, every article I've read recently about seltzer says um, seltzer is here to stay. It's not just a fad. So uh, I think we just have to accept it. Um, I, I, I enjoy the product, to be uh, to be honest. Um, after having a few New England IPAs or a big stout or something pretty heavy, a nice, clean, refreshing seltzer actually hits the spot pretty well. Um, so I think the reason we will have to adapt a little bit. Uh, I think that's what Mike and I are doing, uh, offering that kind of product to the uh, to the consumer, uh, while still continuing to 
brew great beer. So um, yeah, it, it's here to stay and that's um, a good thing. I like how you said that you're, you're allowed to do both, <laughs> you know, it's Indeed. like, it's not just one or the other. You're allowed to do both and be right. good at both of them. Both of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I just have to echo that, you know, as I said before, I've been in the industry a long time and there was a time I will say that I was pretty resistant to change. Um, you know, I didn't want to brew a new England for the longest time. Who wants to brew a hazy beer? Who doesn't filter their beer? You know, but you just got to go with the trends. You got to go with, you know, what sells, if you ask me. And, you know, if there's if there's a consumer that will come in and stay a little bit longer at my tap room because I have a, a seltzer for them um, and everyone else can have a beer, then, you know, that's what we need to do. And it, it's just like you said, Alexander, it's, you know, it's adapting and it's doing both. I mean, there's no reason why we can't have a, a big portfolio and, and try and make everyone happy, you know? And um, I, I think that's that's where we're going. Um, I think people want a flavorful, lighter option. And if you can, if you can provide them with that and make it in-house, um, obviously making it in-house is gonna make you a lot more profit than outsourcing and, you know, and bringing it into your tap room or wherever from from somebody else. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank Mike. you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have Avi back and hopefully um, staying for a little bit, <laughs> um, Avi, I'm just going to go loop back around to that last question I asked you and kind of double in on this last question that I just asked Alex and Mike. So. You know, um, is there any other advice you would kind of have in regards to use Life O or producing hard seltzers? And where do you kind of see this market going? Um, yeah, and we're this is perfect. We're around eight minutes left at the end of this. So, you know, we can fill up that time. It looks like there's just a few questions. So we'll jump onto that right after you answer this, Avi. Sure. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully my connection is stabilized. Um, yeah, so one of the biggest things, one of the biggest concerns that we get are um, filtration and how clear the product is going to be. And unfortunately, it's just due to the nature of the product and of the um, the nutrient itself, it does require very fine filtration. Um, but fortunately, that doesn't really seem to have a huge impact on on consumer preference because like what we see uh so i've had um, the opportunity to try some of Oshlog's hard seltzers uh, when we ran some tests in the labs and i mean they look fantastic they're there's they're obviously you know there's there's that there's going to be a slight tint but like in the glass it looks great um it tastes great smells great and i mean i'm i'm very happy that i i'm able to try a commercial exam so, uh, you know, don't be scared if or, or too worried if it doesn't come out crystal clear because, you know, that's just not going to happen <laughs> with most people. You're going to need you're going to need a active carbon filtration system, you know, the size of your entire brewery to be able to get it like absolutely crystal clear. Um, but it also uh, depends on the substrate. So I know some municipalities as well. Um, or tax zones uh, do require the addition of malt directly into the the drink or into the substrate itself to be you know either for tax purposes or for drink classification purposes, and that's fine. Um, I would say that does add a little bit of nutrient, but uh, just using the yeast life O as recommended, uh, it's not going to hurt, and it's 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 definitely going to help boost those fermentations. Awesome. Okay, so we have about five minutes left and we have two questions in the Q&A. So I'll try to read them off to you guys. Um, I think Avi, this one, um, well, for everyone, but maybe Avi more for you. Um, so basically, do you guys have the number that best represents the balance between carbon and nitrogen? So in this case, carbon is the fermentable sugars. Um, 
that is necessary for yeast nutrition? Um, so as far as a ratio goes, um, I don't really have a ratio, but we typically target, my recommendation is targeting 150 to 180 milligrams per liter of bioavailable nitrogen or free amino nitrogen. Um, and that way you can kind of tweak that to see, um, how it affects higher gravity fermentations. So this is, this is kind of a ratio, or this is kind of the numbers that we use for, for very typical, um, say 12 Plato fermentation. If we go higher, uh, for very high gravity fermentation, so we're talking 25, 28, 30 Plato, um, I will typically aim for about 210 milligrams per liter, um, within that range. And that's just to kind of help give the yeast a little, uh, extra boost. Um, there is some evidence that having too much bioavailable nitrogen can cause some off flavors. So that's why I kind of like err on the lower side, uh, even though like, yeah, not having enough free amino nitrogen can also cause some, some off flavors, but the off flavors that you get with too little, in my opinion, kind of outweigh what you get with too much, because then you start getting, um, amine degradation and, uh, which can lead to just some some other interesting flavors as opposed to say like estuary or fruity um, aromas that you get with with just like a slight decrease in free amino nitrogen. So I, I hope that answers your question, but um, yeah, feel free to 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 reach out to us again if like you need a greater clarification. All right, and the next question is for Alex specifically. Um, what is the highest Play-Doh you have used for seltzer fermentations? And from your experience, would you say that breaking the 90% real attenuation mark, will you get a 100 calorie per can? Um, um, the highest that we've gone was at 25, perhaps 26 Play-Doh. Um, we had the um, the readings we had um, when we wanted to make the can was on our very first seltzer. So I feel that since then we have improved. We're probably closer to 100 now, um, but we haven't checked again. I mean, our lab can give us some uh, some under understanding of where we are calorie wise, but we'd have to send it to an exterior lab. And for now, I mean, our can design is made. Marketing was happy with 110 calories, so we're, we're staying there. But I feel that we're probably uh, closer to 100 now than we were when we first started, um, but we'll have to check. I mean, our, our, we start at 25, but we finish at zero or below zero apparent attenuation. It's it's very, very high. So there's not much sugar left at the end of fermentation. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, that is the last question on here for ask a question. There's only about two minutes left. Um, of our time frame, so I think maybe we'll just wrap it up for now and um, just kind of do a last few shout out things um, for everyone watching. Um, you know, get in contact with your local um, Lollman rep if you have any questions. They're going to be there to help you, and they're going to be able to provide any in information about the Yeast Life O new nutrient product. We're really excited to launch this, and also thank you to Alex, Mike, and Avi because I really appreciate appreciate that you guys kind of took some time out of your days to chat with us a little bit about East Life O and then also giving all the kind of viewers here um, some just good, like hard information about your guys' experience and maybe what they can expect and maybe something that they can learn from. So thank you guys. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I hope you guys all have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are at. So thank you guys. Thank you.